Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Robert Shapiro. I am a professor emeritus of uh, neurological sciences at the Lerner College of Medicine at the University of Vermont. And I'm really delighted uh, to participate in this uh, virtual journal club uh, to talk about a very exciting paper, uh, which is the hemiplegic migraine associated with PRRT2 variations, a clinical and genetic study uh, with the first author being Floris Riant uh, from earlier this year. I can introduce myself. So I'm okay. Amita Pradhan. Right. Um, I am the director of the Center of Clinical Pharmacology um, that's housed at Washington University, St. Louis in the Department of Anesthesiology and is also a joint venture with the University of Health Sciences and Pharmacy uh, here in St. Louis. And my my work focuses on uh, preclinical models of migraine and understanding the mechanisms of migraine chronification. Um, and I'm really excited to be here uh, doing this journal club with you. I was just going to start off by saying, you know, Bob, since you're uh, an expert in the genetics of migraine and as a clinician, I, I was hoping maybe you could start us off by just telling us a little bit about hemiplegic migraine so that we can all be on the same page. Terrific. So hemiplegic migraine is a variant of migraine where the aura portion of migraine includes uh, motor symptoms, specifically motor weakness or paresis or paralysis. It's uh, considered one of the most severe forms of migraine, and it can include other types of traits uh, such as coma or fever or uh, severe cerebral edema or even seizures. And it's rare. So it the uh, prevalence in the population, at least as measured uh, by a study from uh, about 25 years ago in uh, Denmark, is about 10 per 100,000, half of which are sporadic and half of which are uh, familial, inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern. So that would translate into maybe 35,000 Americans right now who uh, experience hemiplegic migraine, which means that it's a rare or orphan disease. And Hemiplegic migraine as an autosomal dominant disease uh, in families has been a huge opportunity from a research point of view and has really advanced the field because uh, starting 26 years ago, uh, the first of these families that was studied intensively uh, using linkage analysis, a technique to identify uh, disease causing genes uh, based upon where they're located, the genome, uh, identified uh, a calcium channel uh, in presynaptic elements, particularly on glutamatergic uh, neurons, as having point mutations which were causative for uh, familial hemiplegic migraine in the families where these mutations were carried. So this was back in 1996. And this was uh, from a Dutch uh, group. And this really had a, uh, an effect to catapult the field because it meant that it was possible to uh, produce uh, point mutations in mouse models, which allowed us uh, to study uh, a form of migraine uh, in animal models. And uh, these first reports came out uh, from the same Dutch group in uh, 2004. And in relatively quick succession, other families have been identified with hemiplegic migraine with essentially the same phenotype uh, first in uh, 2003 in an Italian family uh, where uh, the sodium potassium ATPase uh, pump, which is present in uh, astrocytes was identified. And then uh, finally uh, in uh, 2005, a third uh, uh, gene was identified with the same phenotype, which was in a sodium channel, uh, particularly expressed on uh, inhibitory interneurons, you know, GABAergic neurons. And this uh, was deemed to be uh, familial hemiplegic migraine three. So there was FHM1, uh, which was a calcium channel, FHM2, which was a uh, ATPase pump, and uh, FHM3, which was a sodium channel. And starting in uh, about 2012, there were some sporadic reports uh, that Yet another uh, gene was involved called PRRT2. Uh, and uh, in a couple of surveys before the current study that we're gonna talk about, uh, a Dutch cohort of 47 different individuals who had FHM 
one of them was found to have a presumptive uh, mutation that was causative of the, the phenotype, uh, which was uh, a frequency of about 2.1% of uh, the probands who had FHM. And then uh, two years ago, a larger Australian and New Zealand cohort of 187 uh, different uh, unrelated probands who had an FHM found that four of them had mutations in PRRT2, again, 2.1%, uh, which really gives us the, the setting for the current study, which was a much, much larger study of uh, individuals who had been referred in to- uh, So wait, wait, before we like get into the rest of the study. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to, to, to pause you for a second because I, I just wanted to give you the perspective that I thought about when I first even read the title of the paper, and I figured it would be helpful um, for the, the rest of the people listening in, which is, you know, what exactly is PRT, PRRT2? Um, because, you know, for me, like from a genetics and biology perspective, I was really curious as to well, what is this protein, what is this gene, and what is it encoding? Um, so I'm just going to share uh, a slide quickly to kind of put everybody on the same page from, from the little knowledge that I've got on this. So first of all, so PRRT2, uh, the gene itself, uh, encodes a protein called proline-rich transmembrane protein 2. And so essentially, this is, as the name would suggest, a very proline-rich uh, protein that's encoded by these um, three different exons, which then uh, creates this very proline-rich uh, domain when it's translated. And uh, essentially, this protein is very important uh, for a number of different um, mechanisms. So because it's a proline-rich dom domain, it has this membrane uh, interaction. Um, and in fact, it seems to be that PRRT2 is very highly expressed in glutamatergic neurons. And I think we're going to get back to this as we sort of start to synthesize what the role of this protein is within the greater context of familial hemiplegic migraine. But what's interesting about it is that it's located in glutamatergic neurons which in presynaptic cells, and it's, it's been found to interact with these SNAP25 or snare complexes. And so for those of us who maybe are not that familiar with how glutamatergic signaling happens, essentially, um, and I can just stop sharing just so I can explain it, which is essentially what happens is that you've got this presynaptic neuron and within the neuron, it's full of vesicles that are full of neurotransmitter, things like glutamate, for example. Um, and in order for those vesicles that are inside the cell to fuse with the membrane and release into the synaptic space, there needs to be a bunch of machinery that essentially traffics this, the, the vesicles to the membrane fuses it with the membrane and then causes the release of these neurotransmitters. And part of that complex is called, called the snare complex. And so this gene, this PRRT2 protein, is actually something that helps to regulate the fusion of these vesicles with the membrane and then allowing the release of neurotransmitter into the synapse. And what it's thought to be involved with is actually in order for those vesicles to synapse onto the membrane and release transmitter, it's timed with calcium um, being brought into the cell. And so it's thought that PRRT2 may be sort of a link between sensing the intracellular calcium and causing this release um, of the vesicles um, from the membrane. And so that's one of the roles that it might be involved with. And so you can kind of see how if it was disrupted in some way, there may be uh, altered glutamatergic uh, activity. And then the other thing that it seems to be involved with is with um, the sodium gradient of the cell, which is also very important for the excitability of the cell. So really two places in which uh, this gene might be really important um, for this regulation of synaptic activity. So I think now, now would be great, um, Bob, if you'd like to go back to getting into, you know, what the paper found relative to the other studies that, that you were talking about. Terrific. Yes. So the, the three previous genes that have been identified, FHM1, 2, and 3, accounted for, depending upon which series people uh, looked at, maybe between 10 and 20% of all of the individuals who have been identified with the same phenotype of hemi hem hemiplegic migraine, either sporadic or within families. So there was a need and a search for other potential causative genes, which would also account for families where it was inherited in an autosomal dominant manner, or those who were uh, 
uh, identified sporadically without family members who had uh, any uh, similar phenotype. And PRRT2 was a, a, a growing candidate gene, as I said, because individual case reports were identified in 2012. And then it was also identified in, uh, in series of uh, uh, individuals who were unrelated, who had the FHM, pardon me, the hemiplegia, the HM phenotype uh, as, as probands. And in two different series, this Dutch cohort from 2018, and then this Australian cohort from 2020, it was about 2.1% of all of individuals who had hemiplegic migraine had uh, putative uh, causative mutations in, in PRRT2. So the current study looks at a much, much larger cohort to give us a much richer sense of both how frequently uh, PRRT2 mutations uh, can be associated with uh, hemiplegic migraine, and also really more importantly, what the phenotypes are that we would associate with this. And they looked at two series of patients. The first series were uh, acquired by referrals because this was a French group. They were the referral center nationally for uh, all patients who uh, had this hemiplegic uh, uh, migraine phenotype. And they looked at uh, a, a large number of, uh, of individuals who were screened for one of the three previous forms of hemiplegic, familial hemiplegic migraine. They had 163 unrelated probands who did not screen for any of those three. And they looked uh, and they found mutations in PRRT2 in 12 of those. We don't know what the denominator is of all of the people who were screened who had other types of mutations as well. So it's very difficult to look at a population prevalence uh, for uh, PRRT2 in that particular uh, cohort. But they had a second cohort which were acquired uh, consecutively. And uh, those individuals were screened simultaneously for the three previous FHM genes plus PRRT2 at the same time. And this group, which was very large, so a total of 697 probands uh, were, uh, were screened and really comprised what we think is a better estimate uh, or at least a, a more informed estimate as to what the prevalence would be, at least within this French uh, uh, cohort. And they found that 18 uh, of the 697 uh, individuals who were uh, screened consecutively and simultaneously for all four of these potential uh, causative genes uh, uh, had PRT2 uh, variations of one form or another for a uh, overall percentage of 2.6% or 2.5 to 2.6% of uh, all of those people in that 697 had PRT2 mutations. Uh, and maybe I'll, I'll toss it back to you, uh, Dr. Pradhan, to, uh, to talk about uh, the, the mutations themselves. And, and I, I really appreciate this perspective because I think what it really is showing is that this paper is not necessarily novel in the identification of PRRT2 as a, um, a gene of interest in, in FHM, but it's really solidifying the fact that this gene has been identified um, and seems to, to now, and the numbers are now here to really show that it is like an FHM4 gene. That, that's my sense, and, and is that right? Like. That's, that's my feeling as well, that, that it's yeah. a very important paper, but it's incremental rather than kind of revolutionary. Um, yeah. But it really enriches our understanding of the place of this particular gene as uh, a potential cause for this phenotype, which is really consistent across all of, all of these identified genes so far. Yeah. And did you just want to walk through this? Sure. This? Among the 697 uh, consecutive unrelated uh, uh, individuals who had hemiplegic migraine as probands, that 103 of them, or 15%, could be uh, found to have causative or causative or putative causative genes, gene mutations, uh, for one of these four genes, either the CACNA1A, which is FHM1, the ATPA1A2, which is the FHM2, the SN1A, which is the FHM3, or now with PRT2. So 
in this series, uh, it was about 17% of those that could be identified uh, were PRRT2, uh, which was overall about 2.5 or 2.6% of all of the uh, probands that had, they'd identified. And then they went on to uh, look at these individuals and their, their phenotypes to give us an idea about uh, how often HM uh, occurs with or without other associated diseases that have been identified along with um, mutations of PRT2. And these uh, comorbid phenotypes that occur with mutations in PRT2 come in different varieties. And uh, there are several different epilepsies. There's uh, a benign uh, non-febrile and uh, benign febrile infantile seizure uh, disorders. There's uh, generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Uh, there's uh, epilepsy with chorioathetosis. There are learning disabilities uh, and uh, they're associated as hypersomnia. And then there are uh, abnormal movements. And these can come in a variety of forms, but the predominant forms that have been identified are paroxysmal kinesogenic uh, dyskinesia and paroxysmal non-kinesogenic dyskinesia. So this means uh, kinesogenic dyskinesia is where it, uh, a movement will end up provoking additional paroxysmal movements and non-kinesogenic is where a different uh, type of stimulus might do that. And PRT2 was identified uh, as associated with these movement disorders well before it was found to have these other types of phenotypes, such as hypersomnia or hemiplegia. So in this particular study uh, that we're, we're discussing of the 30 probands which were identified uh, in this uh, larger series, uh, over half of them only had hemiplegia, it didn't have any other of the phenotypes. And the other, uh, others were distributed really between epilepsy, learning disabilities, hypersomnia, and abnormal movements. They were able to characterize all of the individuals who uh, had the uh, hemiplegic migraine uh, variants, and they came up with some uh, very useful um, uh, conclusions uh, or uh, uh, understandings about uh, these individuals that, first of all, the age of onset of their uh, symptoms, their, the incidence of this disease or uh, group of diseases was relatively young uh, compared to uh, the other FHM genes. So about age 12 or so. Uh, the attack frequency was relatively infrequent, one to two per year. The duration of these hemiplegic attacks was relatively short compared to uh, other of the hemiplegic migraine gene variants. So uh, only about one in six or so uh, would last more than a day. So they weren't, really, weren't particularly prolonged attacks, which may be seen in some of the others. And uh, a variety of different movements were identified in this cohort, uh, not just uh, dyskinesia, uh, which was one of them, which is the paroxysmal non-kinesogenic dyskinesia, but also facial dystonia and tics were identified in two. They also uh, were able to uh, point out that at least two individuals seem to be responsive to medications that are sometimes used for hemiplegic migraine. Uh, so acetazolamide in one, and lamotrigine in another. And then finally, uh, looking overall at the, uh, the individuals they identified, uh, plus some family members that they were able to identify who also tested positive for mutations, they found that uh, these uh, genetic mutations were highly penetrant, meaning that when an individual experienced um, or carried one of the uh, variations, the likelihood that this would be expressed as a clinical trait was very high. Uh, and overall, hemiplegic uh, symptoms were in 88% of people who carried the mutations, uh, epilepsy in about 25%, and really only one of the total of 49 people uh, who were either probands or family members of probands with mutations had no uh, identifiable uh, trait which could be potentially referable to the PRT2. So the overall conclusion is that if you have any of these uh, particular variant mutations, the likelihood is high that you will have uh, some uh, identifiable trait with these. Well, and that's what I thought was kind of interesting is that, you know, 
there was no consistent, you know, mutation or alteration in the gene. In some cases, there was, you know, double versions of it. Some cases there were missense mutations. In some cases there was you know, truncations. Um, and it essentially just came down to if you screw this gene up, um, you're likely to have a problem, uh, which I thought was, you know, very interesting because it really just does imply that this gene is very important um, for, for this type of regulation. Um, and I just wanted to sort of, you, you know, it sort of got, got, you know, we've been talking about um, this gene and how it fits into the FHM space. And I sort of wanted to, you know, bring up this little bit of a summary slide because I think it, it sort of um, puts it all together. So, you know, if we kind of think about what's you know already known um, about fam familial hemiplegic migraine. So, you know, as you did a great job of sort of introducing us to it, the first gene, that was identified was the uh, CACNA1A gene, which um, encodes this calcium, you know, CAV2.1 channel. And this is known as FHM1. And so again, if you can kind of put this into context, we've got this presynaptic glutamatergic terminal, we've got the postsynaptic terminal, we've got inhibitory GABAergic neurons, and then we've got astrocytes or glial cells that sort of regulate the synaptic transmission. And so you can see how with the um, mutation of this CACNA1A gene, which regulates intracellular calcium into this um, presynaptic glutamatergic cell, that if you mess up with this, this um, mechanism, which is bringing calcium into the cell, and as I mentioned, that gradient of intracellular calcium into the cell is actually necessary in order for there to be the release of these vesicles uh, into the synaptic space. Right here, you can see from the beginning that if you, if you alter this calcium mechanism that you're going to alter the dynamics of glutamatergic signaling from the get-go. So then when we look at FHM2, which was the identification of this ATP1A2 gene, which encodes the sodium potassium ATPase, which is the dominant sodium potassium ATPase on these glial cells or astrocytes, um, this is a very important regulator for the amount of uh, the sodium gradient into these astrocytes. And what's important about these astrocytes is that depending on that sodium gradient, they then will uptake glutamate or not. And so again, you can see that you've got one mutation that then results in altered glutamate release at the presynaptic terminal. You've got another mutation that alters the amount of glutamate that might be present within the synaptic space. And both of them are leading towards an FHM type phenotype. And then with FHM3, you now have got another part of this whole system that's being um, screwed up where you've got the identification of the um, SCN1A gene, which encodes this NAV uh, sodium channel, NAV 1.1, which FHM3. And so in this case, you know, the sodium gradient within these GABAergic cells is necessary to maintain GABA release um, at these inhibitory interneurons. And so if this sodium gradient is altered, then all of a sudden you have less GABA release. And so therefore, once again, you've got this increased excitability at this uh, particular synapse. And then now with this paper, where we've got this strengthening of the role of PRRT2 as an FHM4 gene, um, again, you've got, we've come back to the presynaptic terminal, and then this PRRT2 is very important in linking these vesicles to the cell membrane to release that glutamate. And if you then alter that, you can then alter the release of glutamate as it's timed with calcium, for example. And so it's, I think it's really interesting how, you know, when you put this all together, there's this confluence of genes that are affecting this particular excitatory glutamatergic synapse, um, but all of the different pieces that can be affected, um, which can ultimately result in a very similar phenotype in patients. And, and this sort of, you know, brings me to the, to think about, you know, do you, do you think, Bob, that like glutamatergic signaling, ultra glutamatergic signaling is not just responsible for familial hemiplegic migraine, but may actually be the cause of headache disorders, migraines in general? This is a really important and central and intriguing question. So the kind of the the core dogma that has arisen in our understanding this particular model of how hemiplegic migraine is occurring at, at a cellular level, that all of these gene uh, mutations, whether they're gain of function, which would be a calcium channel or a loss of function for the other three genes, potentially, they all converge on increased uh, uh, glutamatergic signaling in cortical neurons. 
So the question would be, well, is that true, for, as you mentioned, for other forms of, uh, of migraine? And there's an important clue that I think uh, is emerging here. And on the left, uh, you see the results from the uh, Australian and New Zealand study, which is a, a very similar study to uh, the current one we're reviewing, but with uh, about a quarter of the number of, um, of probands being studied. But what they were looking at was these uh, particular genes, uh, and the first three in this list, CACN1A, ATPA1A2, SCN1A, and then PRT2, these are the uh, these genes that have been identified in autosomal dominant families uh, with uh, familial hemiplegic migraine. They also found an additional half dozen uh, candidate genes, which were also identified among these probands with hemiplegic migraine. And what these all have in common is that they're very low frequency mutations, but they have very high effects uh, in terms of the likelihood of a mutation leading to a clinical clinical finding or a trait. So they have high penetrance, as, as it said. And the question is, for the unknown probands that don't have any mutations from any of these uh, known genes, which in the Australian series was 67%, and in the current series, looking at the, the four uh, top genes, was 85%, should we keep looking for more uh, low frequency, high effect size uh, gene mutations, like the ones that we have been identified so far for uh, FHM123 and now FHM4. And the answer is, uh, there's another potential uh, way to get to hemiplegic migraine. And this is looking at uh, genes, uh, mutations, which are relatively frequent in the population. Uh, so they're high frequency allele uh, mutations but they have low effect size. What that means is that if you carry a mutation, the likelihood that there will be a clinical uh, output from that, that there'll be a manifestation is relatively low. So they have low penetrance when they're, um, they're in terms of their expression if uh, someone carries them. And a series of studies more recently uh, have identified a very large number of these low effect size alleles using a uh, methodology called genome-wide genome association. And at this point, depending upon how many uh, uh, you, uh, you identify, there are certainly well over 100 different uh, uh, genetic loci where there are genes where at least some contribution could be uh, attributed uh, significantly to uh, migraine uh, expression. And using a technique called polygenic risk scoring, it's possible to ask, okay, given the potential effect of, of one allele and its frequency, if you uh, identify these uh, mutations uh, co-occurring in an individual, then the risks increase that migraine might occur. And a recent study out of Finland uh, followed up on a study uh, that was reported uh, a couple of years ago 2018, that using this technique of polygenic risk scoring and looking at, at well-defined uh, populations uh, in the same Finnish population who either had no uh, history of headache, history of headache, history of probable migraine using the ICHD3 uh, criteria for probable migraine, migraine without aura, migraine with aura but with no motor symptoms, and then as the most uh, perhaps a severe form of migraine, hemiplegic migraine with uh, hemiplegic aura, it's clear that as the polygenic risk scores increase, that is you have an accumulation in an individual of more of these uh, uh, mutations which have high frequency in the population but low effect size, that this most severe form of hemiplegic migraine emerges as something which can occur without it being caused by uh, any of these uh, high penetrance uh, uh, genes, gene mutations, such as FHM1, uh, 2, 3, or 4. And we don't know yet at this point what percentage of the unknown uh, uh, or unattributable hemiplegic uh, migraine individuals out uh, in there in the population may be due to uh, 
accumulated uh, uh, low frequency uh, alleles in this way. And what it suggests though, if, that's, if it is true that uh, hemiplegic migraine is principally uh, a result of accumulation of low frequency alleles, then there's an inference that if uh, the low frequency high effect alleles are due to glut glutamatergic uh, abnormalities, well, it may be that glutamatergic abnormalities are really a commonality to migraine in general. Uh, and this is a hypothesis which really needs to be explored and tested. Uh, if, if it's true, then there are potential implications, implications in terms of therapy. You know, as we debated when we were first talking about this paper, I would look at it the opposite way, right? Which is maybe that these like alterations in glutamatergic signaling are the worst case scenario, but then there's a whole bunch of other um, changes that, pro, you know, different types of synaptic changes or protein changes or signaling changes that maybe don't have to do with the glutamatergic sy synapse um, that give a milder version uh, of the same thing. So I, th I think it, it is very interesting to think about, you know, what, what does this tell us? Um, but what, it de what we definitely get from this paper as well as the work that's been done in FHM in general is that clearly that glutamatergic synapse is important for FHM related diseases. Um, the other thing that I, you know, I'm sort of thinking about more uh, from a preclinical um, perspective when I was looking at this paper was, you know, so what are the, what, what would be the next steps that we could do using different types of mouse models or genetic models? Um, and so there is a PRRT2 knockout mouse, for example. So it would be really interesting to take that mouse and put it into different types of migraine models, including things like uh, models of cortical spreading depolarization, which is sort of thought to be correlate of migraine aura, or in models uh, using human migraine triggers like the nitroglycerin model or CGRP. A lot of the other FHM mutations have been put through those different um, platforms of migraine modeling. So it'd be kind of cool to see whether this PRRT2 knockout also shows alterations similar to these other three mutations within these models. So I think that would be kind of interesting. The other thing that I thought was fascinating is that when you look at the expression of PRRT2 in the brain and in this periphery, it's actually really highly, the, the highest expression is in the cerebellum. Um, and then there's also some expression within the cortex, the hippocampus, as well as in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. Um, I don't think anybody's looked within the trigeminal nucleus caudalis. Um, but I think it would be really interesting, you know, okay, the obvious places to look for migraine are in the cortex and then within the TNC, the, the trigeminal nucleus caudalis or in the cervical spinal cord. But I also think it'd be hard to ignore the fact that there's so much of this gene sitting around in the cerebellum, which you know clearly would be um, important in those movement disorders that are happening. Um, but there's also some nice work coming out of Levi Sauer's lab showing that, you know, things like CGRP injected into the cerebellum can show um, light sensitivity. And so suggesting that maybe there, that maybe as migraine researchers, we shouldn't be just ignoring the cerebellum and perhaps there's a little more happening there um, than we might expect. So I, I think it kind of opened up that possibility for me as a preclinical scientist. And what about you? What did you think about it from a clinical perspective? So this, this, uh, cerebellar issue is really intriguing as well. I, I completely agree. Uh, there was a very provocative report uh, in 2005, again from the Dutch group, uh, indicating that uh, what looked like stroke-like uh, events uh, in the cerebellum, hyperintensities on imaging studies, MR imaging studies, were, were really quite prevalent in the cerebellum, which was an unexpected finding because people don't typically associate migraine with the sorts of functions, balance and functions are often associated with the cerebellum. Uh, and that was an intriguing finding and there really haven't been um, enough uh, really pathologic uh, studies, uh, tissue studies to identify what the nature of those lesions are. But it's been out there about whether or not they are um, actual uh, stroke-like events or transient events in terms of function. Uh, so that's an issue. and. Uh, uh, it's also true that uh, Dr. Richard Lewis uh, here in, uh, in New England, Boston, has been looking at uh, patients who have vestibular migraine and has really found some functional findings uh, of uh, mismatch in terms of uh, 
of uh, function which really uh, point to uh, uh, cerebellar structures as being uh, an area of, of malfunction uh, during uh, during migraine. So I, I think it's cerebellum in a way has been a neglected uh, area of, uh, of investigation for migraine. And it's possible that the, these PRT2 mutations can give us some insight into uh, what may be going on with that as well. And then, and then what are your thoughts in terms of, you know, as a clinician who sees patients with FHM, what from this paper, will this change your perspective? So a couple of things that I think are a clinical problem. So uh, a first is that uh, patients who have hemiplegic migraine, and it's a rare disease, but um, certainly headache specialists certainly see patients with this uh, disease. Uh, they will often come to emergency departments and the presumption is they're having stroke and they're at great risk to receive thrombolytic therapy because there's a time window uh, in which to be able to give it. Or it could be that they're uh, assumed to be having uh, status epilepticus or uh, have a, a so-called Todd's paralysis after a prolonged seizure and will be treated for status epilepticus and have intubation and, and be uh, taken to uh, intensive care unit for therapy. And the ability uh, quickly uh, and definitively to say that someone has a potential uh, causative mutation for hemiplegic migraine in an emergency department setting would be very valuable for these people. And it might actually spare them uh, therapies which rather than being helpful might be, uh, might be deleterious or harmful. So I think that that's one area that, that I think uh, uh, would be helpful. So precision medicine related to, to migraine um, is something we're all hopeful for and may not be uh, available immediately, but um, this type of study really gives promise that we might uh, reach that point. And the so other this area, gene would be, would be added to the other three genes as, yep, this is probably FHM. Is that, is that what you mean? That, that's certainly right. And yeah. I think it's fair to say, given how the cost of whole genome sequencing has dropped dramatically, that um, say 10 or 15 years from now, we'll all have uh, uploaded into our electronic medical record, our whole genome and uh, screening for risks like that will be possible in emergency department settings, I think is, is a reasonable uh, expectation. But the other issue getting back to this uh, glutamate issue is that um, you know, maybe uh, the convergence on uh, glutamatergic dysfunction may uh, permit uh, rational drug design to try to uh, intervene, to try to reduce uh, glutamate activity at these synapses. And I think there's some promise to be uh, said for that. The other you know, issue is that um, <clears throat> you know, orphan diseases or rare diseases uh, are increasingly attractive to, uh, to pharma uh, or biotech firms to try to find uh, uh, therapies. And so, you know, perhaps uh, PRT2 will be join, joining these other FHM genes as potential targets for, uh, for rational drug development. Yeah. Well, I think that pretty much sums up our uh, discussion of this really interesting article in neurology. So thanks for joining us um, and hope you enjoy the paper. Thanks very much for including us.